the Evolution Security Podcast. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the EvoSec podcast. This is Aaron and Eric Davis, the Tactical Twins, and we have an awesome guest. We have Return of the Jedi, Episode 3. I know it's supposed to be Episode 6, but hey, this is our Episode 3 with Return of the Jedi, so that's what I'm calling it. Thanks for coming back, Scott. It's, it's an honor to have you on. And I know you're you're super busy. We were just talking about that, and you joining us, um, spending some of your time is is an honor, and um, we really appreciate it. Yeah, my pleasure. My pleasure, guys. Happy to be here. Well, you know, Scott, the biggest reason we had you on was obviously um, a lot of our audience member knows by now that that I had said that I was I was taking your red dot performance. An instructor class here in North Carolina, just outside yeah. of Fort Bragg, and we wanted to have you on to talk about it because, man, it was it was an epic class for me, Scott. I um, I knew it was going to be, but I think I told you um, when we were closing out. I said you can you can know the information. I knew or understood a lot of the information that you're putting out. I mean, James Yeager. May he rest in peace. Um, he put out he put out an excellent video cataloging mm-hmm. your this exact class. Now it mm-hmm. didn't get all of it, of course not. That'd be difficult, but that was a very good representation and a decent understanding of a lot of your technique. But until you are until a person gets the information from you under you. They won't at all get the benefits. I mean, it was profound in the difference in knowing some of the information or a good portion and then having your phenomenal instruction. So, man, I, I'm pumped about what I learned. So Good. Glad you, and glad you enjoyed it. It's awesome training with you. Yeah, it, it, it was excellent. And I'm still, I'm still writing continu- – excuse me, continual. I'm still writing notes, decompressing – some of the stuff that I learned and I've been applying it, you know, I've had a couple of rain sessions and, and have, as I simply just worked on a lot of the drills that we did in the class and man, it's, it's, it's helped me already big time. I mean, I had, I had improvements in the class as well. I, I did have moments and I'll talk about this later in the show. I did have moments where, some of my old technique was trying to conflict with some of the new information I was learning. You probably agree that does happen. Well, I I predicted it happened. Yeah. Remember the back and forth, back and forth, beer starting to taste good. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Right. Subconscious stuff that's already there. It's already hardwired in because practice makes permanent. Yep. And I've got to rewire it, uh, you know, but the good news is, is that usually what I teach you, Usually every time I teach you something new, it's easier than what you did before. Oh, yeah. And it proves through with uh, speed and accuracy. So Yeah, yeah, excellent way to put it. <clears throat> and I have been adopting um, the the content for certain. And I did tell you I was going to get the targets as well. And so I kind of, I think we just start going down some of the list of my notes, if that's hey, cool man. with you, and, and just yeah, talk man. about it. My cat. Let her rip. <laughs> so <clears throat> on... On day one, from the from the get go, of course we jumped right to zero. Mm-hmm. And I would like you to talk about your zero philosophy, and I'll tell you some of my thoughts on it. But can can you describe to our audience members who may not know uh, thus far what your zeroing process is and the difference between the two distances, the two distances out there? Uh, sure. Just so, just in brief, right? Um, the internet, because 
they don't actually shoot a lot, like to talk about minutia, right? Um, and they'll take something which may be a preference based on some practical application or no practical application, but because their uh, their last tactical fantasy band camp leader said it was this was the way. So they go about it and they'll fight to the death, right? So what I basically say is I go through both. I go through a 10 and a 25-yard zero, right? Um, you know, I say the problem – that. But the difference is not that big. Pick one, but pick it based on your practical application, right? Look at the data. If you're if you're LE, uh, look at the data about the average gunfights out there. FBI has some stats that they can that they can look at, right? Um, you know, and if you look at that, it highly favors the ten, right? Am I saying that's right? No, uh, but I'm not saying it's wrong either. And people are saying it's wrong. I think they're kind of wrong with absolutism, right? Uh, and then you know you got the twenty five yard thing. You know, if you your whole existence uh, is judged on whether or not you can shoot high 90s on a B8 at 25 yards. Well, then you need a 25 yard zero, right? If you, if your department or whatever shoots a lot of people in the face at 25 yards, then get a 25 yard zero. But the difference isn't that much. Good gun, good ammo, good everything. It's like a 0.07 difference, right? Um, the mistake that people make that love the 25 yard zero, like it pays them. Right, is that when they use the same target at 10, the NRAB8 target, and they put three rounds in the smallest surface area, which is 1.7 inches. 10 yards, that is not a zero, that's a coordinate. So you need a smaller area, right, which is a one inch square. Okay. Um, then when we get done with that, we put three rounds in there, we get an aggregate, right? We get three rounds. Um, in the uh, in the one inch square, and then we go out to twenty or twenty five. I'm sorry, and then we shoot my logo. Where there's a black circle in my logo, which is the same size as a nine or in a B eight. It's a little harder than B eight because you don't have the lines to walk in, yeah. right? But you know, I'm trying to go practical application on this stuff, right? Um, and I do that, and then I talk about how they should be judging and they should adjust at zero. The end of the day is this. I don't care what zero you pick. Just have a practical application behind it, right? And if you can't do anything with it, right, you have a 25-yard zero, but you can't score, you know, 95-plus on demand, right? Uh Or even if you have a 10-yard zero, right, and you can't hit shit at distance, right, vice versa, then just it's not worth anything. You know what I mean? Um, the bottom line is this, right? If you can shoot, it doesn't matter which zero you pick as long as you do it correctly. If you can't shoot, it doesn't matter what zero you pick because you can't shoot and you're not going to hit anything. You know what I mean? I forgot. Am I allowed to swear on this thing? Oh, absolutely. I'm, oh, yeah. okay. Because you can't hit shit, right? <laughs> so get off the internet and get practicing. Right. You know, people all these days, they, they, they go back and forth, man. You know, I say two things. Hey, number one, that Mike Pannone walks into the chat and goes, I got a 15 yard zero. What you guys know about that? Right. Number two, you explained to me how with the 10 yard zero, right, which is the basis. And then I confirm where I hit at 25. Fortunately, with Walther's, I don't really need to do that much. Right. Because, you know, it's such an accurate gun. Sorry for the capitalism there uh, <laughs> that, uh, you know. I can do things at three, five, seven, and 25 to a high level because I'm out practicing, not, you know, mentally masturbating about which zero I'm going to do before I even get to practice. Does that make sense? Hopefully that wasn't too long. No, no, that's, that's perfect. And there's a couple of comments that I wanted to make um, based on that. And the first thing I'll say is any, any respectable instructor – in in my opinion, and I I know that Aaron agrees with this, and and I'm I'm darn sure not putting words in your mouth that you agree with this as well. Any instructor worth their salt demos, right? It's not even a choice. Y yeah, it, 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 but <laughs> yeah. So, th but this is one comment I wanted to make: mm -hmm. is even the instructors that I respect greatly don't demo as much as you do. Every single drill that we were going to do, you demoed it. Every single one of them. And by, by and different stages and minds, and I called the times I was going to do within a quarter second, and you know, depending on the uh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah I, I I really respected that, and uh, yeah, and I mean, just seeing you, and again, the the different gradations of speed, it, it really helped me a lot too. Um. 
<coughs> with those varying degrees of of speed as well. The the other thing that I was going to mention, and I mentioned this to you on the line, because I was driving home after day one, and the first thing I thought when we were zeroing, I was like, man, my old eyes, I don't know if I'm going to be able to see those those inch squares. And and I was I was mentioning to you that I I thought, man, I wonder if Scott's target, because it's almost like a light craft color. Would you agree mm-hmm. with that? And, yeah. And to to like just looking at it at a glance, um, at least for these old eyes, it's a little harder to see those lines until I was doing the right thing and focusing on the target. And all of a sudden, oh, there are the lines right there. But what my point <laughs> was to you is like, Scott, did you choose that color on that for that very reason? Remember, I asked you that. Yeah, and I said no. <laughs> That's just what. That's just what Maryland uh, or the National Target Company uses. Uh, the interesting thing is, is like for example, the one-inch squares, right? They're not full; they're they're hollow squares. Mm-hmm. Right? If that makes sense, I'm sure there's a better word for that, right? That's just because I wanted to see the holes better uh, than, like for example, on the pistol training target. There's one-inch squares there, uh, and that's where I got my one-inch, you know, philosophy from. But they're but they're um, uh, they're blocked in; they're full, mm-hmm. right? And at on an indoor range where I was used to shoot, you couldn't see if you really you couldn't distinguish where the holes were, right? Where with that hollowed out square, you can see them. So that that's why I do it. Um, on the uh, two inch squares with the letters, because you asked me about that. Um, no, that was just if if you're having a hard time seeing, bro. I don't think it's because of my genius, because of your <laughs> shitty eyes. So. So, so, but yes, that no, that's a that that's a an important point though, is that my mind thought that when we started mm-hmm. the zero process, but yeah. then it quickly came, became apparent to me my vision isn't that bad where I couldn't see it, but I think for me, is that it forced me to use the dot correctly as well, meaning right. that I really had I, I if I got sucked into the dot, I would lose the square. Or I would lose the letter, depending on which one we were using. But when I was using the dot correctly and focusing on the target and not the dot, man, everything was was decently clear, clear enough for me that I could yeah. that I could make it out. And so, yeah, that's a for the audience out there. If you're interested, I'll put Scott's targets in a, a link in the show notes because it's a valuable target. I mean, I personally like having lots of targets to use for varying reasons and sure. it's just a new it's just a new awesome target in my inventory so yeah folks get out there and support scott and 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 grab you and it's a good deal too i mean you get it like is. Like 54 bucks for 150 or yeah, 20, I don't know, something like it is wow. great i was i was impressed so well eric did, did you have you said you had one more comment about um, cuz I want to interject a question here in yeah, a second. Go, go ahead. Go ahead. So forgive me guys earlier I had to run off my cat cuz he was about to come up here and and lay on my computer. But um, and so I didn't get to ask this question. Now, Scott, I'm curious. I guess there's there's this is a two-tiered question. I bet you get this get one of these asked a lot, but I'm curious there, there's, there's, there's a lot, a handful of podcasts and commenters talking about instructor courses. I'll tell you, Eric and I have basically only taken instructor courses lately. But I'm curious, why offer instructor courses? Um, what's your philosophy behind that? And then the second, the two part question, I guess, would be. Why is there, why do we have to have a red dot instructor course? Because some people will poo-poo that and say, just line up the siding system and fire, etc. We know better than that, I'll be honest. But um, so that... Uh, well, I have a red dot instructor course or just a red dot course, period? Um, red dot instructor course. So so let, let me ask this. I, I, um, I might have been a little confusing. Let's first cover... The aspect, why offer a instructor course in general? Uh, because if you're a well-known national level instructor, people are going to ask you for it regardless of what you do. Interesting. 
interesting. Right. Right. You ever, you know, go and whether it's at your job or your, or, or some volunteer work, you're, you're a squared away individual. Eventually they get you running shit when you don't want to. <laughs> oh, right. This is a funny way to hear it. <laughs> Right. So people ask you for instructor classes. You know, the first time it was Santa Ana PD was my first instructor course. They asked me to put together. I'm like, all my courses are instructor courses because I teach you how to coach. This is just more deliberate within my methodology. Right. So that goes to the other question. So that's that's the number one question. Right. Uh, what was what was number two? Was why have it? Yeah. Um, Red dot specifically. Yeah. Well, for me. For me, here's the deal, right? My methodology is unique because it comes from a jujitsu background, right? And the way we teach in jujitsu. Um, so the mistake that people make, I think, is this, right? People come to me to, yes, learn how to shoot the dot, right? And accomplish what, uh, hopefully, what I can accomplish or get a peek into that, right? But they're not coming just for the dot. If they were coming for just the dot, they could go from any Yahoo who had a dot on it, right? They're coming to me to learn my way and how I do it, right? So I think that's the end user class for performance, uh, fundamentals and performance. They're coming to see how I do it as opposed to how Aaron do, uh, uh, Cowan does it or Dan Smith does it or whomever else is teaching red dots these days. That probably said they were stupid for seven years ago. Anyway, moving on. Um, <laughs> when they come to my class, they want to learn how I do it, right? And that's the that's the end user part. When instructors come to my class, they want to learn how I teach, right? And so he, here's the thing, man. Uh, the way I teach is the same with uh, Red Dot Pistols. It would be the same way that I, if I, you know, would teach, uh, help teach the kids class at jujitsu, right? Or if my professor was, you know, uh, at a, doing a seminar or something and I ran class, it, it, it's the same way. It's the way that I teach, right? So that's the reason for my instructor class. Uh, the development of explain, demo at varying speeds, explain every nuance, explain the why behind everything build up the structure, right? And get people to understand and maybe change some paradigms, right? To make things easier. Do the reps to rewrite the old bullshit that was there that was not fast and accurate and then put it under pressure. That's how I do it, right? And then the coaching in between and then, you know, putting down into paper with supportive collaborative uh, um, uh, paper, you know, paperwork or whatever you want to call it, uh, documentation, probably a better word than paperwork, uh, documentation, uh, so that they, so that they can remember it longer and immediately build their program. Yeah. So that, that, that's the reason for my red dot program. I think if you ask that same person without sounding like an ass, I think if you ask that same question to other people, they couldn't give you an answer other than to make money. Hmm. You know what I mean? Um, and, and I think that's the big key. Everyone's poo-pooing, you know, or I guess, you know, my program right now, uh, just volume wise, right. Is one of the, the most prolific red dot, uh, programs out there, right. Whether it be AIWB red dot, regular red dot end user or the instructor. Um, and you can argue with me or the internet all day long about whether or not you agree with my technique, but the purpose of the class is for me to show how I do it. Go do your own stuff. And at the end of the day, you got to ask you, you got to ask yourself, if you're always better, how come you're not faster and more accurate than I am? <laughs> right? And that's not, and that's not a dig. That's a, hey, man, that, I always ask that. I always I go, like, hey, man, I do this, I do this. How in the F does Donovan Moore do 14 splits on demand? Right? I don't care about 14 splits. I honestly don't care about 14 splits, but I want to know how another man who puts his pants on the same way that I do can do that. And I can't, especially since I'm so much better looking than he is, you know, <laughs> my boy Donovan more point one tactics, go train with him. Right. Um, start asking yourself that question. Instead of attacking the technique that you don't understand because you didn't come to the class, instead of ignoring all the empirical data of people writing reviews and getting better, fast and accurate, why don't you ask yourself, why do you think it's not accurate? And if you're accurate, how come you haven't accomplished anything then? 
you know? Uh, and I think if we ask our questions, that, ask those questions to ourselves, um, we'll all get better and we'll stop asking silly questions. Like not, not, not the questions did not originate with you. If you will ask that question, yeah. I'm not calling your questions silly, oh, yeah. but it's 10,000 times before, yeah. you know, and the bottom answer is because we can. And if we can, we do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and, and the reality is, is that is a question that's come up a lot recently. And, and I'll, I'll just say this, um, the individuals that have bring, been bringing that question up have been bringing it up for education purposes and to allow other individuals whom, whom we respect as well to, to answer that question of why to have instructor classes. And, mm-hmm. and, and I think that, you know, that's one of the reasons Aaron and I talked pre-show, and that's why he wanted to ask that oh, question. Okay. 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 Yeah. A um, couple other reasons, like business wise, why you should have instructor classes, right? Other than the fact of making money, right? Making people better and stuff like that, is that you create your own feeder market, right? Yeah, I didn't it, do it. The, Keep saying that because that's great. I love yeah. hearing it that way. So, so I, I didn't say it so much in, uh, I, actually, I didn't say in the class that you were in, uh, Eric, because we were pretty much because of what was it? Something weather or something like that. We we had didn't we have to cut first day early or something? No, maybe this maybe it's in the class. Mm, but think, we were going we were going start to finish. Yeah. Right. Yep. Hard start to finish, right? Um so I usually do this little marketing thing for especially for civil mostly civilian instructor classes, right? And I ask the question, like, here's what you guys gotta come up with, right? Um, and this is stolen from a, a guy by the name of Guy Kawasaki, right? Angel investor, uh, business consultant, right? You need to come up with your uh, your mission, your market, and your mantra. I won't go into detail because it's like an hour discussion, right? But at the end of the day, you know, when you're coming up with those three things, you have to ask yourself, why would a student come to my class when Jedlinski's class is available? And if you can't answer that question, you don't know your own value added proposition, right? The answer is, is because I'm not local to your area. That's why, right? So if you can establish a thing like, well, I went to his instructor class. Here's what I got. I may not make you as better as he can, but man, if I can make you 10 to 20, 30% better, that might be the margin in which you do better in whatever your application is, right? And I say that, they're like, oh my God, you're absolutely right. You know what I mean? So that's that's what we have to think of. We have to think of those things, and that's why you do the instructor class, because I do that. This guy teaches a class, right? He drops my name as, you know, where a lot of the information came from and endorses me, and the next thing I know, my class sells out in two weeks in that area. That's that's an excellent point. Well, and, and I listened to another great podcast, um, gentleman named Lee Weems that we've become friends with, and he's a lot of fun, and Mm-hmm. And he he had a show with with Tom Givens, and I was he was referring to, and, and we'll put it out here like this: it's the type of instructor that Eric and I are becoming, which is gateway instructors, which is which I think is 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 exactly what you describe, but just using a different word, um, gateway instructors, and and the fact that. Like you said, you guys can't fill all the demand for every class, but even before we've we've heard you, we've heard Tom talk about it. So Eric and I, it's going to be fun. We're gonna we're gonna teach a two day um, shooting and combatives course this weekend. Mm-hmm. And what we've always thought is we want to give people a taste of ECQC. We want to give people mm-hmm. a taste of these national level pistol instructors. And at the end, we're going to say, this is good stuff. Hey, go to these guys too. Again, we've been talking about being that kind of instructor for a long time because we want people to support the people that are really, that are teaching us, that are that are doing such great things. And to be frank, I mean, another reason is going to those classes, it's a blast. You know, yeah. th- that's an aside, but I-, I just find that interesting. You said almost like feeder instructors, and it's the same thing as gateway. So I- I- that was cool to hear you. Well, say. I, th- I think gateway, you're talking more about like beginner types of thing. You know what I mean? So, and you, and you definitely can be, 
um, a person that is going to be using my material is not going to be teaching beginners. I yeah. don't think. Yeah. I mean, even though the techniques do work for everybody because the body works the way the body works. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, I like feeder because it's like, well, I'm bringing in this, right. Uh, I went to the class, I got a skill, I got a craft. I'm going to share my understanding of it. And then I'm going to feed them on up to you. You yep. know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, where gateway, a gate can be closed. <laughs> so <laughs> that's why I prefer feeder over gateway. Good, interesting. Good, good point for certain, Scott. Let's talk about our sponsor, Origin. Pete Roberts was told you could not make jujitsu geese in the U.S. Well, Pete and his team have proven the naysayers wrong by producing the best jujitsu geese on the market. I, for one, love my path gi. It is lightweight, yet strong and super comfortable with an innovative technical fiber weave that is also IBJJF legal. The wave logo is legit. It has woven belts that blend between white, blue, purple, brown, and black, hence the name, The Path. They also produce jeans, hoodies, handmade leather boots, and Jocko Fuel Supplements that help us recover from hard workouts, force on force classes, and simply make us feel better and more energized through the day. I just finished a hard workout in my garage gym and rewarded myself with a delicious mint chocolate milk protein shake and coconut milk. Man, it's like dessert. If you're looking for any Origin products, please go to our show notes and click on the affiliate link or look for the icons in our blog section of our website at evosec.org. It helps us keep this podcast free and keeps the lights on. If you get something out of this show and you feel like helping us out, use evosec10 for 10% off at checkout. Let's talk about our sponsor, Tenacore. Tenacore continues to innovate with pressure test purpose-driven carry solutions from holsters to mag pouches to carry and duty belts. Their new Zero underbelt builds on the high-performing Zero belt, adding loop Velcro to the outside, making it the perfect platform to support your duty belt, competition belt, or if you simply want a reinforced carry belt, this is the ultimate solution. If you're interested in picking up one, visit Tenacore. Dot com. So, Scott, let's get back into some of the meat of the class. And you mentioned something just a minute ago that really uh, was, I guess, for lack of a better better term, just near and dear to me. And that was your use of jujitsu. Of course, Aaron and I both um, are practitioners of jujitsu, mm -hmm. and I think one of the coolest learning and demonstration tools you use was was with the stance. I mean, all throughout the course, of course. But mm -hmm. one, that is one of the things that I really took away was how you brought me to stand upright. Mm -hmm. And and just your demos, including using, using foot sweeps to show mm -hmm. how that is even more stable than you would think the more um, leaning forward um, st type stances. And... Although before I came to the class, I used kind of a, I don't know, modern isosceles. My, my support foot was about, if I can use this, mid, mid foot with my... Yeah, yeah. you were you yeah. heel to instep. Yeah, They're very mm -hmm. good. And then you had toe to heel. Just yep. that toe yep. to heel. Yep. Heel perpendicular toe, yep. And, and, and then standing upright. As I was practicing this week, because I'm starting, you know, a lot of dry fire, and and I'm like, man, this is probably going to be one of the best changes for my shooting. And mm -hmm. and I'll I sit there and say that, you know, Mike was more upright when I trained specifically under him. I'm not sure where I got the the more leaning forward that that I had kind of allowed in, or maybe. Um, from I don't know what others instructors we had been with that kind of pushed towards that direction, but that 
standing upright is is a big deal. And again, to point back to your demos, with the use of emulating recoil and mm-hmm. and having various clients in the class demonstrate and how easy it was to want to anticipate that. And mm-hmm. and again, using foot sweeps, I, I really liked that part of the course and gave me tools on how to better articulate and espouse that stance as well. So that was mm-hmm. that was certainly outstanding. So let me ask you this on that note. Um, did you ever I didn't even think I was going to ask this question. Did you ever have a more forward-leaning stance during your upbringing? Okay. I was curious about that. Yeah, of course I did. Because Magpul, guys. Oh. <laughs> I mean, there's not, and there's no reason to tiptoe around that. I mean, I know we don't want to mention other instructors and yes. stuff like that, but, like, but I mean, there's no, there's no getting around that. The tactical turtle was because of Magpul, and everybody did that. Mm-hmm. Is the tactical turtle wrong? No. Is it inefficient? Yes, we know that now, right? Again, the analogy I look is if you look at the Hall of Fame basketball players from 50 years ago, they're nothing compared to the, uh, you know, to the uh, athleticism of, you know, the recent Hall of Fame inductees, right? But those guys were building the game. The latter ones stood on their shoulders, right? So as far as a tactical turtle goes, man, my theory is everything comes from the great American pastime of everything has to be a cheek weld. Right. And the only way you're going to get that carbine, right, is, is to do that. And then we start shooting pistols like that, too. Mm. <clears throat> right. That's, that's where I think it comes from, which, you know, logically kind of makes sense the way we shoot our carbines. But we don't get to the bottom premise of why do we need a cheek well? Because the Russians are shooting AKs like this. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, so that's basically that. Right. And, you know, all those body mechanics came from when I basically went to classes. I'm like, I just kept on saying to myself. I don't get it. I mean, I'm going to do it because I'm a good student, but I just don't get it. I've never pointed anything in my entire life with my thumbs. Why am I painting forward the thumbs when I have an explosion going off in my hands? Right? I didn't, I've never stood in a Sosceles in my life except for when I was, you know, five years old learning horse dance for the first time. And that's just to understand weight distribution and, and balance. You know what I mean? Uh, I would never fight like that. I would never roll from standing like that. Right. So why are we doing it with an explosion going off at the end of our hands? I never got it, but I did, you know, and then one day, you know, I think I was hurt or something like that. Uh, I just went, why am I training guns differently than I'm training jujitsu? Why am I taking this guy? Right. For example, if you, if, if your professors, right, showed you a technique and it didn't work while he was demoing it, what would you say? Yeah, probably not gonna do it that way. No, you it would no, it would go deeper than that because it's your professor. Yep. He's awesome, and all of a sudden he's starting to demo something that doesn't work. What is going on? Like the the whole paradigm, the whole sea level change of what happened. You were like you would start doubting the existence of everything, right? Then we go to a firearms class, and the guy demos it. If he demos it, and he's explaining the technique, and he can't hit anything, and he's not fast, but we go oh, resumes. So we start doing that shit. You know what I mean? Right? Yeah, yeah. So I just like, I don't, I don't care about the person. I care about the technique and can they do it? And when I started doing that and supplying that methodology to my practice, boom, everything started to take off from there. So m- moving on after stance, mm-hmm. what the, the berm, the berm drill, mm-hmm. one of the things that you also did throughout the, the course is that you gave us options. But I mm-hmm. think more importantly in in the berm drill is is you had us do the first repetitions. I think what were we doing? Six rounds fast. Yep, six yep. rounds. Yep. Six, six rounds fast into the berm. And I like that as a tool because you take away the focus of the target and um, whatnot. And you said, okay, I want you to do it your way. And then you had us adjust the way we stood leg forward, a le- leg a little back, so on and so forth, and had us shoot another repetition. You had us have arms more bent or arms locked out and and then grip high, grip a little lower. All, during all these repetitions, 
the main thing, in my opinion, and you can tell me if I'm wrong, is number one, you were wanting us to see the efficacy of of the posture and stance you were giving us, but also yet to give us some options and what we were seeing. And during, during the various repetitions, being able to remember what we saw and be able to self-diagnose. I mean, can you can you hit on everything that you were trying to accomplish? Yeah, well, let's clarify what those stages are. Yep. Um, so first when we start off, go ahead. No, that's okay. First time we start off with uh, isosceles bent forward at the hips, arms locked, right? Six rounds. I ask people what they saw. It's usually chaos. Then I say, stand up straight, put your heel perpendicular with your toe, but keep your arms locked so that we can isolate each body mechanic. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, and then what you'll find is that it got a little bit better, not great, but better. And no one's exhausted from the performance that they picked up. So why wouldn't you do it all the time? Next one is stand up straight, lead foot forward, heel perpendicular with toe, elbows bent half an inch, just your elbows, not your scapulas, your your pecs, your shoulders, your glutes, your quads, none of that. Just <laughs> bend your elbows half an inch or bend your elbows how much you bent them before you came to the class. And then I showed them my grip, right? And then we just see the progression of the dot moving or not moving based on each one of those applications. And inevitably by the end with, uh, when all those things are combined, everyone's just like the dot was just in the middle oh, wiggling yeah. there. I, that's amazing. Yep. It, yeah, definitely. And we do it in 36 rounds. Yeah, that was that. 36 rounds. People master recoil. The, and by the time we get to the grip gun doesn't move anymore. Okay, Scott. So we just spoke about the berm drill Mm-hmm. And we we went into the correct me if I'm wrong. This is just from my notes. We moved right into the draw stroke after that. Correct? Yeah. Yep. So I I will say this: you're the you're the only the second instructor that that Aaron and I have trained with. Well, I guess I only to this point myself, but that uses the draw stroke in reverse as you instruct it. So, I mean, essentially, mm-hmm. we're starting from <clears throat> fully gripped pistol, you know, at your methodology with the with the slight upward angle of the muzzle and and starting, uh, of course, the that portion of the draw using the wave technique. But that, to me, and I wanted to ask you this, <clears throat> excuse me, after I kind of describe it, um, using that methodology in reverse, it mm-hmm. just from my opinion – seems like it's a way more efficient way of getting people to to get the proper efficiency in using that method. Is that one of the reasons you use that in reverse? Um, yeah. Yeah, it is. But, you know, I don't know, again, if it, if it was just clear to me, simple to me, or if it was actually, you know, an epiphany was, I mean, why do people come to my class? Because they can't find the goddamn dot. Yeah. Mm. Right. So attack that problem first. For example, you tell me if I'm wrong. uh, Right. In Craig's class, he does not teach it in reverse. No, 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 he doesn't. Because what is more important than everything else? Well, he's almost position two. Yes, exactly. That's the reason he teaches that way. So starting in reverse, you're not learning the meat of what he's trying to do with the entangled fight. Right. My class, your biggest worry is to present out the gun and not find the dot. So let's attack that first. That's why I do it in reverse. Th- that that makes perfect sense, and that was my thoughts on it. It's like you're te- yeah. you were teaching us your draw stroke, mm-hmm. but also during all those repetition is developing, of course, the wave and the pinky, pinky pressure, and making sure that the dot comes from the twelve down into um, the the center of the window, and you acquire the dot perfectly. So, yeah, that was a brilliant way of of, of teaching the draw stroke for certain. And just for the just for the audience out there, just to make sure. So, and and Scott, correct me if I'm wrong, if I'm articulating this incorrectly. But but the first the first repetitions was fully gripped pistol, yep, and and pressing out from the upward muzzle, pressing out and pinky pressure, oh. finding a dot, We're presenting out, presenting. Pardon me. Uh oh, yeah. I, I don't like I, to use the word. Yeah, that's I don't right. like to use pressing out because the next thing people start doing that they press is they punch. Thank you, so and that's part of the thing. that's part of the four P's, yep. right? Um, which I was yep. going to hit on here in just a second. Thank you because that's something I'm having to correct in correct in my 
enunciation, but but yes, as far as presenting a pistol out, in, in that's that's the first set of repetitions, and then you had us okay b- break the grip, and then marry marry the grip, and then of course the four Ps, and that to me one of the things that you I, I guess I had heard this somewhat before, but. I've had such a, a developed marrying of the hands for so long, I don't think about it as much anymore. But that, but the register point of the index finger knuckle with the, yep. with the uh, middle finger knuckle, it, again, you gave us all these cues throughout the class that I think, man, that's, that's the way you can get newer people to understand how yep. the hands mate together. Yep. So, and then, uh, again, that was the marrying of the grip. And then the second, this, excuse me, the third repetition was starting with the, with the hook grip for us with the uh, appendix carry and then presenting out and then the full draw stroke. Yep. So w- one of the things. The claw, I call it the claw. To claw be specific. Yeah, yeah, thank you. What did, what did I call it? Did I call the it? Hook. Oh, goodness Gracious, and it's sitting right here in my notes. Oh, well, whatever. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> no, I think it is. <laughs> I only clarified because people listening to your podcast are like, dude, you have the claws. Is there a hook? You know? <laughs> no, no. I, I'm having several Freudian slips here, even though no, you're right good, here you're good. But yeah, that was actually a good clarification for me as well because I, I've I've even though I saw you present that material in James' um, video, th- I, maybe I just didn't pick up on it as well until again being under you in the class and then having your diagnosis yeah. of uh, that. That was a big game changer for my draw stroke, by the way. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, until you're truly there, you know, with me um, reminding you about being violent out of the holster consistently and not letting you get a, letting you not letting you get away with a pull rather than a pluck a bounce a stab out of the holster is really where the money of the class is oh they're, they're, so i'll i'll put it to you this way so the urgency of the draw you know the way that you describe getting everything done here as fast as possible and then gradiating, depending on what the distance or the or the target size itself. Of target. Size of target. Yep. yep, size of target. That's right. You you spe- specified that it's the size of target that matters yep. more than anything else. That can be because of distance, or Correct. it can be because of just a little tiny target. Yeah, that's that was another yeah. another brilliant um, way of putting it. But the other day I was practicing not just. Um, not just what we worked on in the class, Scott, but also I worked some of our demos for our next class. And, and excuse me, the class that Aaron and I are teaching this weekend. And what I will tell you is it seemed like all of the par times, either fairly uh, easy, easier par times, but I was blasting those par times just mm. simply because of the draw stroke work. Yeah, because you're so far ahead of it. Yeah, and and that was the first thing I know because I keep track in my notebook of of those you know d- depending on what I'm working on, and and it was at least 0. 0.5, 0. 0.6 seconds faster, you know, just overall. And I know that my draw didn't get 0. 0.6 or 0. 0.7. It was just everything was so much more efficient after working with you. And I just wanted to make sure that. So, I brought yep. that point out because it was it was very de- demonstrable when I was mm-hmm. practicing the other day, and and so moving on to the full draw, and this is another thing that that I really liked. I would say that a good amount of national level classes, the aim is one point five seconds for a concealed draw. That's the aim, but. Scott, you had a – that was our first part-time. Well, but what do I call it, though? I call it a national standard. It, yes, yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
but to me it's it to me it stuck out as a cue that hey um you know sometimes we need to allow ourselves that hey we can shoot faster and that's a even though well go ahead but, or 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 urgent go ahead we can do the things that aren't aiming and shooting sooner mm -hmm. which makes the whole thing faster absolutely right <laughs> yeah so that was one thing that kind of stuck out to me is the fact that we started with that 1.5 par and of course you had us going faster than that but here's the thing we spent all that time we we worked quite a bit of speed during that first portion of the day and i and and if i'm not meaning to skip over things on purpose but for the mm -hmm. for the sake of the show this is something that stood out to me as well is that on day two we we backed it up to complete accuracy and slow precise work and and i really really appreciated that and and for for the audience out there let me get to to my notes because I've shuffled them around a little bit. Is <coughs> damn, I'm getting choked up here. And give me one second, guys, while I get get to my proper set of notes I, here. I have an effect on that people, man. They get emotional. <laughs> yeah, you <laughs> I'm choked up, man. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a chick flick in here. So I, I just wanted to describe this for the audience because I think it. I just hadn't seen it done in, and I'm being specific. I hadn't seen it done this way in an, in advanced class before, mm -hmm. um, because there classes that you normally you think you're going to just burn it down, and might some folks might think that about your class as well from what they may see yeah. on the internet. But I mean, we it may be my perception, but I could have sworn we spent over an hour if not closer to two hours on on just the precision shooting am i am i correct about what time how much time did we spend uh, about an hour and a half yeah, yeah so if we get done we started uh 8 30 we do a little registration little class picture we get to out there by nine yeah about an hour and a half Yep, an hour and a half on position. Yeah, and and again, we had worked all the speed or a lot of speed work yesterday, the day before, but then we we you had us back down to just pure precision, and we we shot at two inch squares, and the first cycle again, kind of getting into how you were teaching us how to coach, is we shot a group, you came around and and each and every one of us you diagnosed. Mm -hmm all of us and and mm -hmm. really excellent points and then you had us do a cycle where we did some self diagnosis mm -hmm. and then another cycle where well both of the coaches you know the the partner I had shout out to Keith he shot a group I coached him and I shot a group he coached me so we would did those full cycles and everybody learned a ton I know I did Yep, and, and talk about your philosophy on that. By the way, um, coming back to that pure precision, and and just kind of hit on some of your methods. Uh, well, I'll just say this: I used to say to myself, "Press and press," you know, "press, press." Mm -hmm. I went away from that. I'm not sure why, but can you explain why you even say that to yourself? I, I like okay, what you so put on that. Questions in there. Let's unpack all that, yeah. right? So the press, 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 right? So what I say is uh, when we're trying to go for hyper accuracy, whether we're zeroing, hitting a B8 at 25 yards or a two-inch square at 10 yards, right? Um, all these, in my opinion, don't, internet, don't take offense to this, right? If you want to talk to me face-to-face, -face, you know, whatever. Uh, we use all these nebulous terms like smooth, slow, fast, anticipation, Words that don't mean anything, but we keep on using them, right? Uh, so uh, I kind of forgot my point to that. So the first part of, about uh, press, 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 right? Um, it has nothing about slowing down or anything like that. It's about giving myself something to do so I focus on the process. So I can keep the Cooper and Stephen A. Smith out of the front lobe telling me to go faster or that I suck, 
right? Yeah. The key to the press, press, press from what you used to do and what I do is when I instruct students, they say, press, 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 jelly applying pressure to the gun goes bang. Here's the key point. You don't care when it goes bang, right? Because 95% of the time, what we call anticipation is not anticipation. It's a lack of patience, yep. right? What's this going to happen? What's it going to happen? What's it going to happen? What's it going to happen? Fuck it. Let it happen now. Yeah. And they drop shots, right? On compiled, compiled, uh, compounded with a shitty support hand grip, right? So that's why I do that. Okay. It's a, it's to keep you into the process, right? And not get yourself out of the process. And while you're saying press, 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 again, the Cougar and Stephen A. Smith can't get into your front lobe. So that's why I do that. Right. Um, what was the other question? Why do we actually do so much accuracy at the beginning of the day? Yes, and and, and I'll ask this on the on day two as well. Yeah. Yeah, I think he's saying well, why. On, I think he's saying why on day two is the philosophy. Yeah, yeah. Why am I? Why do I? Why do I start? With why, accuracy? why? Why on day two? And and yeah. also why spend so much time on accuracy? I know it sounds like a loaded oh. question, but I, I I like I like your your thoughts on this. No, oh, because accuracy is harder than speed. That's yeah. why. Yeah, and it is. It, it is. And and I'm yes. gonna I'm gonna use myself as an example, Scott. Mm-hmm. Is and I'm still working this out. Um, it, you know, being able to shoot groups on demand with just making sure that I'm printing that because I mean, yeah, we you had us on two two inch squares at ten yards. It's a it's a decently small target. And mm-hmm. and the last time I practiced it, I was about, I was running ninety percent. I was running about eighty, maybe seventy or eighty in your class, because I, I I'm I'm just I'm still working on that myself. But what I, the point I was going to make is I made master class in IDPA back in two thousand two, without ever being able to shoot decent groups. And I'm still working on that. Still working on it today, but I think that's the point you were kind of making. Accuracy is more difficult difficult than speed. Yeah. So, well, it takes more discipline, right? Mm-hmm. You have to have all the technique there and everything like that. Where speed is just rounding off the edges, not going slow where you don't need to be slow or whatever, right? And then doing the rest of things carefully, but getting ahead of it. So we have more time to do those things carefully, right? The, the difference between a person who has a one second draw and a person who doesn't have a one second draw that can hit an alpha, they can both hit alphas at seven yards, right? The difference between the two is the sub second guy is doing everything sooner and more efficiently, right? But the foundation for that, right, is that you got to hit the target, Okay. That is the bottom line. You have to hit the target, okay? You can do anything you want, blazing speed as much as you want, but if you can't hit the target, nobody cares, Yeah. right? But that's not saying that accuracy is more important than speed, right? Everyone says you can't miss fast enough to win. Well, you sure as shit can shoot slow enough to lose. Yep. Right? So it's always funny to me, right? Because the progression of it is I'll, I'll get a guy in almost every class, maybe two, three, four, that'll come up to me and they'll go, oh, what's this accuracy stuff we're doing here, bro? I go, yeah, man, you got to be a, you got to be a well-rounded shooter, right? You have to be, if you're not, nobody cares, right? Chuck Pressburg and I just did our second joint class and everyone's like, oh my God, this is meshing so well. You know, we thought there was going to be, you know, that you guys were going to have all these conflicts. No, man. Two sides of the same coin, speed and accuracy. Stop thinking that you only need one, right? Right? N- name the guy that can do a one and a half second build drill that can't hit the target. Can you name him? No. Nobody cares. On the other hand, name the world, the current world bullseye champion. Can you name him? Because nobody cares. <laughs> yeah. Nobody cares. Nobody effing cares, right? Because you're doing it all slow fire and stuff like that. Nobody, nobody gives a shit, right? It's the balance of speed and accuracy. The reason why Chuck and I's class is so well is because he can do a 171, three and two drill cold, right? And I can do 98 five X's in front of 20, 30 people, 
That's why I mesh so well. You need both. Yeah. You need the balance of speed and accuracy, right? And then they'll go, okay, I get it. You know, I got that skill set down now. Now can we go fast? I go, bro, you have been working for the last hour and a half on the uh, basis of going fast because you will go faster when you're not worried about can you hit the target. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. That, that was, that was a outstanding um, portion of the class for certain Scott. And I, I always have to throw this caveat out there because I'm just being honest is that I don't shoot master class level anymore that I had, I've had more important things. Master class what level? Um, IDPA level? IDPA. Yeah. Yeah. Sure yeah. you do. Sure you do. Well, what? Ma- <laughs> sure you do. Ma- ma- maybe, maybe I do. I haven't, tested that in a long time but i know at least well let's put it this way probably before your class maybe some preparation and then during your class maybe yeah yeah but i appreciate that encouragement i need to stop poo-pooing all my (laughs) my own capabilities but but yeah i got it now i definitely don't shoot uspsa (laughs) like you got oh you you're saying you don't shoot like a uspsa master yeah that's 100 percent correct yeah Absolutely. It's 100% correct. Yeah. I mean, I'm going to tell you how it is, yeah. right? Yeah. IDPA master is B class in USPSA, yeah. right? But if you're B class, you're a half percent of the 1%. Just know that, yeah. Yeah. right? And, 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 and no, IDPA people, calm down. I'm not poo-pooing mm-hmm. on your sport. You've actually done uh, amazing strides in the last few uh, years, <clears throat> right, uh, to make that sport uh, – part of the century. So well done guys. Well done. <laughs> yeah. There's, there's no question that USPSA in that sense, there, there, there is a difference for certain. And, and, you know, that's one of the other aspects. And I wanted to bring this up as well is it's another good reason why I need to make sure that I'm competing. Cause I'm going to be up front. You had a lot of excellent, uh, peer competitions in your class as well. You know, mm-hmm. uh, you, shooting by yourself under with your peers is a is a shit ton of pressure. And I know it's not the same thing, but I k- kind of same thing as what? Uh, same thing as what? I'm, yeah, I was gonna. I'm sorry. Bring, give give the example that there's a lot of pressure when you put on that fist helmet and do an Evo in ECQC or or an Evo in Cliff Byerly's class. It's a mm-hmm. different kind of pressure, but the pressure that you feel when you're under that kind of peer pressure in a course like yours is just so important. And also, when I when I got to some of those pressure drills, I choked several times. And I think I'm bring, I, I'm I'm bringing the main point is I think it's so important to compete, and I just have not been competing in recent time. And I think that's one of the, the good aspects of, of being on the line multiple times that, that can kind of inoculate. So I'm going to, I'm going to agree with that. I'm going to clarify that yep. though, for those people that simply go, I don't have time, right? They set their priorities, right? Their priorities is, is life or is work, life, work, family, right? Uh, they have the correct uh, priorities because they do jujitsu <laughs> Right, because they're learning how to do it with their goddamn hands, right? And they supplement it with firearms training, maybe a little, uh, you know, uh, dive training, medical training. You know what I mean? And then they're saying, "Now you want me to compete? Now you want me to go spend four hours once a month or every other week, you know, shooting and pasting?" T- I, I just, I just can't do that. Okay, cool. The competition is just not USPSA or IDPA or Steel Challenge or whatever, right? Uh, you got into shooting, right? And you probably have some friends that like to shoot. So get together with those guys that shoot at least as good, maybe slightly not as good as you, maybe slightly better than you, and go talk some shit and get to the range, right? Compare notes, bet money, pizza, bragging rights, whatever you want, and pick a standard until you guys have shot that thing out, until you all can do the standard, then move to the next one, then to move to the next one. Right. Um, I, I'm going to go on a limb here and I'm going to say that you guys have watched uh, the guys at tier one mm-hmm. uh, shoot tier one. Right. Yep. You've seen Sawyer. You've seen Aaron. You've seen Jared. You've seen Jack shoot. Right. Yep. They do formal competitions. 
No, they do oh, not. Interesting. They have, yeah. but right, but they're all super high level shooters, you know, in that performance genre, that that new emerging genre, right? But how have they gotten so well? Is because those four groups of guys, right? I mean, they're Mormons, so they don't talk shit, but those four group of guys <laughs> push each other constantly to constantly outdo each other. And that is the definition of competition, right? You against other people with a, uh, uh, a uh, comparable skill set, right? To a standard or metric test that you did not come up with, with quantifiable grades. And then you talk shit. Yeah. Right. To the point where there is a detriment if you are not successful. Yeah, that that's that's a really good way to put it, Scott. And I and even though in the back of my mind, I definitely believe that. That's been something that's I guess for lack of a better way of explaining it, a part of of our upbringing and shooting. But I think it's good that you brought that up because I was kind of one level saying, hey, I just need to compete more again. But no, that's a very good example the audience will will certainly appreciate. I think people make a horrible mistake, right? And this is me, competitors out there, you know, you, you say what you want to do. I uh, say what you want to say. I think it's a horrible mistake to cannibalize your jiu-jitsu time to go compete. Oh. I, if you can do both, awesome. If you can do, do both, that's amazing, right? And whatever your... um uh, focus is right. If you never want to, you know, roll with another sweaty grown man, I get it, dude. Go compete all you want, and it'll make you better, right? But if you're a jujitsu guy and you want to and you want to cannibalize your jujitsu to go compete, or I'm sorry, to go uh, to go, yeah, to go compete, mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you to maybe take my idea, find some yeah. buddies that talk a lot of shit, and get better that way. Yeah, that's that's, cool. a, that's a real good point, and that's certainly something that I'm not willing to do is is cannibalize my my jujitsu um, j just for uh, competing sake. Well, well said, Scott. Um, now, <clears throat> because we're probably getting a little longer here, I I'd really like to talk about your standards. And we had a couple of guys that were on the edge. But, mm -hmm. I, but I, I just wanted to bring up that point is that, man, your, your standards are legit, and and I just wanted you. To, I know you've talked. You probably talk about your stand. Have to talk about it or answer questions on it more than you may care to. So I apologize. No, no, it's okay. No, no. But but I would like to talk about your standards because man, uh -huh. there. I I told you at the beginning of the class because you asked us. Okay, what do, what do you want out of this class? Well, you know, I, I believe I simply said number one. I want to get better. I want to learn how to run the dot and be able to help people with the dot. But I also want to leave this class with the ability to practice better towards your standards. My goal is to meet those standards at one point. Mm -hmm. I'll, yeah, so, yeah, th those are some very aspiring standards. Can you talk about them, buddy? Yeah, so um, people ask me why you, why you need standards. Well, because your students are going to ask for them regardless. They're going to ask for them, right? And... Um, and it was the way I was teaching the class and actually coming up with those standards, which I demoed and had, you know, theory. and stuff, They provided a much better structure to the class um, as opposed to uh, what I was doing before. What I was doing before was structured, but it wasn't, it didn't have, it didn't have a pin, a, a, how can I put this, a clear path to what I was doing, Right. For example, like you go to jujitsu, right? And you're doing um, side control, right? Well, before you get to side control, you got to learn how to pass the guard, right? You need to learn how to control the head with shoulder pressure or whatnot, right? And then you can have the very, and then you get into the very submissions, right? But there's a thing, we're going to learn side control, right? Um, and then the pluses and minuses to side control as opposed to other controlling positions, okay? So, Along those lines, right, what were the major things about the red dot pistol that people were worried about, right, or had concerns about, or were absolutely just put the adamant about, right? Well, the first one was uh, the, uh, the the dot is slow up close, right? So let's crush that one with the three and two, but let's yeah. put a uh, let's put a methodology behind it, right? Uh, the other one, you know, the uh, dot is slower 10 yards and in. Well, 
the standard for a draw, whether you believe it or not, right? Where everyone, you know, that 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 uh, IG, you know, uh, uh, slippery slope has always been one second, right? No one goes, oh, dude, you don't have a one nine draw, you don't have a ninety draw, then you're shit. Everyone says one second, one second, one second. So let's put that as a standard. Let me show you how to build up to that. And then the iconic, you know, a skills test for static, you know, uh, gun manipulation has always been the build drill. Right. Mm-hmm. So if two seconds is it for irons, let's do this for the dot. And then at distance, based on the Tuller principle, if mortals can hit 1.5 A zone at seven yards. And red dot mastery should be able to do it almost four times the distance in the same time. So that's where they came from. And then the in the modulations, the gradations of each, you know, national class and black belt patch standard and the techniques that came in there. Um all the components were always in the class. This just put it into a very digestible formula with skill, uh, with skill building and a better flow, right? Um, and then you, you got to have a test, right? Too often this industry was like, oh, okay, we learned all their shit and now we're going to do the guy standards and it had nothing to do with what we learned for the past two days. That makes zero sense. Yeah. Right? So I wanted to have that formula and you want people to have a goal. You know, um, every person who says you don't need a one second draw. Okay, that's cool, bro. Then, but what are you working to get better at to make sure you have that surplus of skill? You know what I mean? Uh, I could do 1.5 in practice. <laughs> we getting that on them streets, right? Because the degradation of, of uh, skill under pressure. So let's build up that surplus of skill, <clears throat> right? All those people just never had really had goals or a path to get there. My class gives you a path to get there. So Scott... Leading up to taking your course, I, of course, mm-hmm. I gave your standards a try a couple of times mm-hmm. out at the range. I dry fired them as well quite a bit. The one testament that I take away from just trying to even move towards achieving that is it's the first <laughs> time I really worked this hard um, at speed again. It's been a while since I worked really hard on speed until I uh-huh. started working with your standards again. So that's a testament to that as well. I just wanted to add that in there. Yeah, appreciate that. Speed and accuracy, two sides of the same coin. And, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, we didn't have anybody meet the standards in, in our class. Is that correct? We didn't. Uh, I believe his name was Brian, the guy from Wise County Sheriff. Mm-hmm. Uh, he hit two out of the four. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so so that's one of the things that that I might have been confused on. Can did you go away from from using uh, the the belt system other than the black belt? Are you still using the blue, purple, brown, and black? Or, oh, those those grades are up on my website. Track if you want to if you want to. Yeah, and I can I'll post them in the show notes. But but I'm sorry, I'm just making clarity for myself. You in. In the class, you called it. So you had your black belt. You have your three and a quarter, which is the is the what? It's the baby samurai patch. Is that? <laughs> yeah, it's a big samurai I, patch, I yeah. think I think that's cool because that's still three quarters. Is pretty damn good. Um, yep. But the you you said you articulated the the national and the class standards. Can you clarify that yeah. for both me and the audience? So when I first when I so when I first came up with it, right? I want to do it. Just do uh, for your own personal improvement, right? Have a white, purple, brown, and black to be consistent with the, you know, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu belt system, mm-hmm. right? Uh, but as we all know, when Jiu-Jitsu guys, all they ever fucking talk about is Jiu-Jitsu, you start losing people. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. And I wasn't going to have the black belt patch standards and do demos for three other belt levels. Ah. Right. So doing four, I wasn't, I wasn't going to do that. Right. Plus those times were based on what I thought were national levels. What I thought you'd be great with to be able to accomplish in my class. Right. Versus the black belt patch. Okay. Cause more people don't do jujitsu than they do jujitsu. Yeah. Right. We're talking about it would be uh, uh, nauseating to them. So I just break it down to a term they can understand national class and the black belt high standards. Gotcha. That makes a, a lot better sense and good for our audience so that they understand if they go to your courses as well. Um, yeah, that that I was a little bit confused on in the class. I just wanted to to ask for clarity on that. But yeah, that's 
I, I get that too, but here's one of the things that I'll bring up is, is I loved when you asked the whole class, hey, do you guys train a jiu-jitsu? And, you know, of course there were several of us that did, and, and you simply said, if you're not, you need to be. And I like that. That's Just, not what I said. But, uh, it, well, I something similar to that. <laughs> what, ha, said, what the F are you, what the F okay. are you doing? Okay. <laughs> yeah. uh, mine was the G, G version. Yeah, yours was the G version. <laughs> yeah, I Which like it. Doesn't have the impact of what I say. Yeah, that that is true. That is true. Yeah, it's not to go down that road, but man, I, I am starting to the point where we, you you articulated several things about, or excuse me, several uh, practices that we want to do: medical, of course, jujitsu, boxing, the shooting piece, all of that. But I'm getting to the point because it's hard to get people to do any of those, I started relenting and say, if okay, at least do jujitsu and shoot. You know, if you do those two things, you're at least going to move in the right direction. But uh, with that said, Scott, um, with the technical difficulties, I'm going to go ahead and turn this over to Aaron because Aaron's got some jovial questions for you. Jovial. More jovial. I did want to bring this up real quick because you guys are talking about accuracy and, and shooting the bull at 25, because of my eyes, I could never try and hit a bull at 25. And I think mate earlier this year was the first time I got everything in the black. And that's because again, I never practice it, practiced it without my eyes. But um, yeah. So, but, but what I'm getting around to saying is the Glock trigger was just fine for me until I, I started shooting at distance. So I, I'm just curious. I, I know you shot Glock for a while, and so yeah. I'm sure you tried your best to, to clean that trigger up. What was the best thing that you found um, to, to clean it up? And, and Give it to AJ Zito of Practical Performance. The man's a genius. Okay. He can take anything without really changing the geometry of the trigger, polish it up, get rid of machining and burrs and castings and stuff like that. And you'll have, uh, he'll be able to get you a three and a half pound rolling break. That's butter. Oh, awesome. What's his name again? AJ Zito. Okay. Practical performance. Okay, cool. Now, so this is, this is bringing up a little topic for me and, and I'm not spilling the beans just yet totally, but I am having, mm -hmm. What, what to me is the uh, kind of a dream carry pistol. And one of the things that I am planning to do is actually, I'm not planning, I already sent it off to CNH to have a millet for me, which is for, for, for the new Holosun EPS. Okay. Um, and I was curious if you've got to mess with that dot very much and, and your thoughts on it. Um, because um, it's waiting on my desk at home to be put on one of the smaller Walthers. Oh, cool. Cool. I, yeah. I, I mean, Calder 4 loves it. God 4 loves that thing. I'm of the, I'm of the school, more gun, more better, more optic, more better, but he loves that thing. So we're going to give it a good college try. I don't understand how a bigger dock and, and bigger and smaller windows better, but Hey man, I've been wrong before. So we're going to put it to the test. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to getting one. You know, it's going to, my pistol will probably be complete from the different people that are working on it in January, but I got to find that dang dot first too. Um, I mean, it, it, they're out of they're out of stock everywhere. I know they're just out, but I mean, excuse me, they haven't been out very long. But yeah, I I can't find them anywhere. Yeah, I think that um, our our partner might have a, a source, but we're still waiting on them. But so then, one last thing, Scott, and then we'll let you roll out of here. You know, okay. something that you know every. Of course, everybody knows you for for the pistol, and and I just was curious about this because I've never heard you talk about it. Is if you're much into carbine too? Well, define much into carbine. Well, well, just just if if you train it often too, and and um, what my own personal training is carbine. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. My, well, I mean, do I personally train with the carbine? Yes, it is my home defense weapon. Cool. I have I have I have a sixteen and a twelve half inch uh, 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 Sons of Liberty 
uh, rifles, carbines. Uh, and if anybody comes in, they're going to be greeted with that. So, yeah. Well, that's cool. Because, you know, I just don't advertise. Because so. interesting enough, you know, as good as Mike Seeklander is with with the carbine too, he still says, you know, he would probably grab a pistol. So and and so I think it's cool. I mean, with with your level of pistol craft, that that you would still choose the carbine. But I, I think, well, I mean, if it's readily available and it's right there, yeah. You know, I'm not gonna tell you how it's staged in my house and stuff, but yeah. you know, if I'm in my living room and something happens, well. Well, I got my pistol on me. I don't have my carbine on me. So I think that's what Mike means. It's just, it's always on him. Like it's always on me. Mm -hmm. uh, I feel equally proficient with both, you know, the rifle, more bullets, easier to hold, you know, easier to control, um, more effective ballistic damage, easier to shoot. Yeah. But not easy to hide where the pistol is. Yeah. Yeah. If we could, if we could conceal SBRs or whatever, you know, we, we would definitely do it. Now, I'm curious. So we talked about just a little bit ago, um, Kyle DeFour. Have you, by chance, been able to hit one of his classes? No, Kyle's just a good Kyle's a good friend because we both taught at um, Shearer Symposium, right? Uh, he's done his best to mentor me because he probably, if there's anyone in the country that teaches more than me, it's him. You just don't see a lot of it because so much government contract work that he does, right? Uh, but, yeah, we, we talk about it all the time. Stuff. Stuff. Yep, yep. Well, I think we've taken a, enough of your time, Scott. You know, it, it's again, we're just honored that you would come on our show. It's a it's a blessing to us, and and I'll tell you, your your downloads on our our show are are pretty high. So oh, um, cool. So it, it's it's awesome for us, and and you know, we'll let you have your time and and get some rest there in Nashville. And, and so you're teaching some LE classes coming up this week, right? Which is kind of what you do. Uh, Brentwood time. PD. Yep. Doing Brentwood PD, uh, then a day off and then open enrollment in Tampa area and then, uh, offer Thanksgiving and then on and on and on to the break of dawn. All right. Well, we're going to let you go, Scott. And, yeah, man. You have a you have a good evening and and I'll see you here next November also. All right, sounds like a plan. All right. Take it easy, buddy.